at uh, this question for a couple of weeks now. Uh, if the church was a church, would it make a difference? And I hope that as we've been going through this series, you've been asking yourself that question, um, not only in a wider scope as a church and a larger community, but also individually, uh, in your relationships, in your marriage, in your home. Uh, is there a way that God wants us to live that would make a difference? So uh, as we've been looking at this topic, um, I think, uh, and I've been thinking about this, praying about this, and wrestling with this, I think we, at least I, maybe we, uh, had this longing to make a difference. I think everything we're involved in, we're constantly asking ourselves, you know, does my presence, my activity, my thoughts, my words make a difference? And if, if you're anything like me, um, being a little bit more introvert in social settings, sometimes you think about what you're going to say a couple of times before you say it. And maybe it's not so much what we're going to say, but if we say it, will it be good? Will it be accepted? Will it be meaningful? Will it be heard? And no matter our personality types and how we communicate and what we relate in, we constantly are valuing our worth and we want to be appreciated, noticed, we want to be seen. And so as we look back at life, we want to go back through situations. As a matter of fact, I think the most memorable moments in life, the moments that we hold close to our hearts were moments that made a difference. Moments that helped us grow, moments that we celebrated, moments that we uh, paused and thought about certain milestones that we hit individually or collectively. And those are the things that we hold close to our hearts. So if we were to fast forward our stories to the end, what would be the things that we would remember? What would be the things that we would celebrate? What would be the things that would make us smile? What would be the things that would lay heavy on our hearts? See, I think the majority of the things that I'm involved in today are the things I spend my time with. I'm going to get to the end of my life and not remember any of those. But I will remember if someone challenged me and helped me grow. I will remember the times that someone helped me. I will remember the times that I brought a smile to someone's face. So, what are the things today in your life that are bringing purpose? What things in your life today are bringing happiness and joy? What things in your life today are helping you grow? Or maybe what things are you doing to help someone else grow? Today's title of the message is something that I believe, or the content of today's message is something that can make a difference in your life and especially make a difference in the lives of those around you. Today's title is The Power of Width. Can you say that with me? The Power All right. Um, and so I believe that there's power when we do things with other people. So something interesting happened in the last two, three years, not only COVID happening, but even before COVID happening, there was, we were already trending in certain directions as human beings. And so a study came out on national trends of social connections starting from uh, before 2020 up to 2020, just showing us trends of social activity, social communication relationships in our country. And so household family social engagement decreased. The amount of time we spend together as families over a period of 17 years, instead of going up in time that we spend with each other, went down, and it went down five hours um, per month. So we spend, are spending less time with our families per month than we did about 17, 20 years ago. The other interesting thing said that we share less time with other people, right? We're more isolated now than ever before. From 2003 to 2020, we decreased 14 hours of companionship per month. 14 hours. When we look at social engagement with others, with people that aren't as close, but what we used to do stuff with other people that weren't as close, we would hang out, go eat together, have a cup of coffee. That decreased 10 hours per month. Non-household family social engagement decreased six and a half hours per month. Social engagement with friends. This is the one that kind of hit home to me. I'm like, wow, this is amazing. Um, not amazing in a good way, but amazing in a bad way. Like, the amount of time we spend with the people that we choose to spend time with. Like, so you don't choose your family, but you do choose your friends. All right, you can take that one home for today and think about that one. 
So social engagement with friends decreased by 20 hours per month. So when we look at the landscape of social interaction, when we look at the time that we're spending with those that we choose to spend time with or those we have to spend time with, um, it has all decreased. And so what that tells me is that we're living life not with other people, but we're living life more alone than we have ever lived before. And so there's something to the slide I had up here before. Well, we got lost a week. Okay, it's back. Thank you. Um, the power of with. Learning to spend time with others, loving spending time with others, not just those that we love, but learning to be like Jesus. Maybe you knew this, maybe you didn't. But did you know that Jesus spent time, 100% of his time, with people that were nothing like him? He spent 100% of his time with people that were nothing like him. He spent 100% of his time with people that didn't understand him. He spent 100% of his time with people that didn't accept him. He spent 100% of his time with people that didn't see him. He spent 100% of his time with people that didn't believe him. But there was something about Jesus that caused people to begin to live their lives a little bit differently. And that began to make a difference because people stopped living life on their own and they began to understand the power of with. So what if there was a better way to live? What if there was a better way to live through our relationships? What if there was a way that we could make a difference in our lives, in our world today? So my point for us today is this. Through the power of with, we shape a greater story impacting the world around us. Like, you have a story, I have a story, and I'm sure they're great stories. I'm sure that we would love to tell our story and share our story with someone. Because our stories have value and purpose when we share our stories, when we tell our stories, when we live out our stories with other people. And so there's power in the with when we're sharing our stories with the people around us. And when that story merges with the story of Jesus, change happens in our lives and change happens in our world. And so uh, last week we started the story of Nehemiah, and Nehemiah had a humongous heart, but he was far away from home. He was living in a, in a place of Babylon and then called Persia, and he was living with other people that were nothing like him. But Nehemiah had found a place, it was a comfy place. He had a good job, although a risky job. His job was to be the cupbearer for the king, and so basically a very easy job. Um, didn't have to think too much, um, but every day could be his last day because he had to try the king's cup before the king did. And so if somebody wanted to kill the king, uh, Nehemiah would have died first. And so a uh, very easy job, but highly risky. And so he's still alive. <laughs> and he's living at home, his new home. And one day one of his friends comes back from his old home, Jerusalem, and he says, how's the city? How's the people? How's the walls? And when he hears the story of what's happening back at home, his heart breaks and it crushes and, he, and he's no longer content of where he is. He's no longer joyful. He's no longer happy about what's happening. The story says that he's crushed and he falls down to the crown and he begins to cry and weep. And he's just sad that he's fine, but his people aren't fine. And so he begins to pray, and that's what we talked about last week. He begins to pray and ask God for a plan, for a direction, for a purpose, something to make a difference. And he pleads to God and says, God, please forgive my sins and our sins. And God, we just need you to step in. And God begins to work. And so today we're just moving, we're skipping one part of the story. And if you're not comfortable with that, that's okay. You can get back home and read Nehemiah 1 and 2 and catch the gaps that we're not going to cover today. We're jumping all the way to Nehemiah chapter 2. And in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 17, Nehemiah's already back in Jerusalem. He has money from the king of Persia. He has equipment. He has tools. He has everything that they need. And so he shows up and he does an assessment. And after his assessment, he brings every bun together. And this is what he says. He says, you see. It's not I see. It's not they see. No, he says, you see the trouble that we are in. 
And it's a, it's a fascinating way, it's a lesson on leadership that Nehemiah shares with us, and it's also essentially the power of with, where Nehemiah says, I see the mess because I wasn't here, now I'm here, and you guys are just a mess, but I'm not going to say that because we're in this mess. And he says, I see it, you see it, we're, we're in big trouble. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. In other words, what Nehemiah is saying is, if anyone comes after us, if any of our enemies finds out of the situation we're in, we're just sitting ducks here. And so he's not pointing fingers. He's not casting blame. He's saying, we all see this. I think one of the most powerful things that we can do as human beings is to not live in the future Not live in the past, but to live in the present. And one of the trickiest things for me is sometimes to see my reality, right? Sometimes I'm just projecting and of who I want to be. Sometimes I'm projecting of who I'm pretending to be. Sometimes I believe my own lies and I think I'm a good human being and I do good things. One of the hardest things for us to do is to look in front of a mirror and to look into reality, to accept reality, to embrace reality, to embrace our shortcomings, to embrace our faults, to embrace our mistakes, to accept that we're not perfect. Many times when we get to those stages of, of, of reflecting or looking within, many times we just resort to blaming someone else. It's my dad's fault, it's my mom's fault, it's my sibling's fault, it's my boss's fault, it's my friend's fault, it's the church's fault, it's the pastor's fault, it's the politician's fault, it's every... Everyone else except us has some fault in the situation that we find ourselves in. And so it's very, very hard to accept reality. But when God steps into the picture, he kind of helps us with this. And God has a way of showing us reality where reality doesn't hurt as much as if somebody else were to show us reality. You see, the city gates have been burned. The walls are destroyed. They're just sitting out there. They're vulnerable. They're weak. And so Nehemiah wants everyone to recognize reality, to not run away from it, to not kind of shrink at it, but to sit in it. And maybe that's where God has you today. Maybe you don't like your reality. Maybe you've been trying to do the impossible to change reality. Maybe you've been forcing God's hands or you've been forcing situations, trying to have control, trying to manipulate, trying to lie through it. You're wanting to change reality, but the more you try to change it, the worse it gets. Maybe, just maybe, God today wants you to sit in your reality, to accept the fact that things aren't okay, To accept the fact that maybe things aren't going to work out the the way you wanted them to. To accept the reality that maybe your kids aren't going to do every single thing you tell them to do. (laughs) Struck a vein there. Um, Maybe that's where God wants us to sit. And it's not because he wants us to be in more pain and not because he wants us to kind of just, you know, suffer a little bit. Maybe it's the only place where he can begin to help us. Sometimes we go to the extreme situations and extreme moments. Sometimes our realities are very different to all of us, and even when they're the same to all of us, we react differently. So, for example, um, um, Mateo, my youngest son, a couple of years ago, was, um, we were walking outside of a, a restaurant, and um, we were talking to some of the people that we had went to the restaurant with just, you know, you know the Hispanic goodbye? Anyone know about that? Hispanic goodbyes are like five goodbyes that take about an hour. You start in the restaurant, and then you keep talking outside, then you keep hanging out outside, and then you realize that you were leaving, and then you say goodbye again, and then you might get caught up in another conversation that you didn't have time for before, but you just remembered, and most of the time it's just gossip, and then um, you finally get to the car, and you're now talking, someone's in the car, and you're talking through the window, and um, by the time you left, you're gonna call them again because you remembered something you forgot to tell them. Um, So this was happening, Um, and we're outside. My kids don't understand the Hispanic goodbye because they were born here. Um, They understand the American goodbye, which is bye, and, Um, This wasn't part of my notes, as you can tell. Um, So my kids are running around kind of that area, and I'm looking at my kids with one eye, paying 
conversation with the other, and I had a feeling that something was going to happen, and, and it did. Um, Mateo was running, and, and Leo kind of passed him, and Mateo trips on one of his legs, and at that space and time in his life, Mateo was, was very innocent about life, and especially falling, where he didn't put his hands out to kind of crash his fall, and so he just went chin first into the ground. Um, and so I saw it happen, Silvana sees it happen, and we see reality and we're reacting completely different. I look at him fall, I'm like, yeah, he's all right. Like, he fell on his chin, you know, it's okay. I have a chin too, I've fallen on it multiple times, he's fine. Savannah's reacting like the world's coming to an end, right? Like, like, you know, asteroids are falling on planet Earth, Jesus is coming back, someone in the background, we need to call, you know, everyone over, the whole hospital needs to come over. And I'm like, oh, he's fine, he's fine. And I'm just calming her down as I'm calming him down. And um, I'm, internally, I'm hoping that nothing's wrong because if something is wrong, then my reaction has been very, very off. And sure enough, I pick him up and he looks fine from where I can see him. And then all of a sudden, Savannah sees blood and she's like, there's blood. And I'm like, there's no blood. And I remove his hands from his chin. I was like, oh, there it is. Um, and his chin was completely open, completely open, right? One reality, two ways of dealing with reality. And sometimes our reality will push us away from people because we feel they're not reacting the way that they should. Sometimes we're reacting because they don't understand the gravity of reality or the depth of it or the influence of it. And so instead of reality sometimes bringing us together, it breaks us apart. And Israel was broken apart. And so Nehemiah's trying to bring everyone together by saying, giving them an invitation to see. It's not the situation they're in. It's not whose fault it is. It's not where we're coming from. It's where we are right now. So right now, what does your reality look like? What does the reality of your family look like? What does it feel like? What, what are you trying to do to change it or force it or manipulate it? Maybe God just wants us to sit there for a little bit. And not just to sit there and wait for it to be over, but to sit there and to see how God wants the power of with, his presence with someone else's presence, to begin to move reality in the direction that God wants to lead it. The story continues, well, the same text continues, and, I, and, and Nehemiah says, come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be what? In disgrace. He doesn't start telling them they're in, they're in disgrace, but he ends there saying, hey, this is reality. We don't like it. It's not comfortable, but it's not eternal. It's not forever. God wants to lead us out of this, but we have to be willing to move together. You see, sometimes God's not going to move unless we're ready for him to move. Sometimes God's not going to change our marriage unless we're both willing for the marriage to change. Sometimes the relationship with our children is not going to change unless we're working with our children, not against our children, not for our children, but maybe with our children to move through reality. You see, maybe the church is not moving in the direction God wants it to. Maybe we're not the full picture of Christ, not because we don't have the right facts or the right Bible, not because we don't worship on the right day, but maybe, just maybe, we're not willing to move together. You see, the power of God and the power of with is not independently making good decisions, but if we're collectively coming with one purpose, one calling, one God, to allow him to move, to allow him to work. What if God wanted us to sit in our realities, not to punish us or make us suffer, but just for us to be ready for him to do what he wants to do? God might just be waiting for you today. He might just be waiting for you. And it's not about working for God. It's not about doing things to God. But it's about being with God. With him. The power of, the power of with that God wants to move today is in unity and purpose. It's to make a difference. To make a difference in your life and to make a difference in the world. True power is found not in, in what? It's not in isolation, but in the power of with. It's finding ways to work together, support one another, and to lift each other up. 
So just for one second now, wherever you are, where has God put you today? What job has God placed you in today where he wants you to work together with someone that may be nothing like you? Where has God placed you today in your relationships and your families where he wants you to support one another, not to work against one another? Where in your life today, in your season of life, do you see someone that's down, that needs to be lifted up? I think one of the things that we many times miss out on is the ability to speak words of affirmation into people's life, to speak words of affirmation into our children's life, to recognize something good that's happened, and to just take a moment to pause and celebrate it. You see, many times by not celebrating the good moments, the good things that have happened, the change that has happened, we don't have any fuel left in the tank when we have to sacrifice something. So I think that the more we celebrate, the more fuel we have in the tank, the more energy, the more desire we have to give because we're celebrating the good things that God has done, that we have done to bring growth into our lives. So just for one minute, can you just think about one one good thing that God did for you this week? Did God do one good thing for you this week? Did God do one good thing for you this month? Did God do one good thing for you this year? How many of you have thought at least one thing? Can you raise your hand? All right, can we give God a hand? Can we just celebrate God for that? The fact that you're here today or watching online, that you have breath in your lungs, that your heart is beating, that's one good, essential, life-changing thing that God has done. We can pause every single day and say, God, thank you so much for doing that one good thing in me. And when we thank God and take the moment to pause and thank God, we begin to see God working in other people. By pausing and affirming, thanking, congratulating, celebrating someone else's success, we work with the power of with. In Nehemiah chapter 3, the story continues, and Nehemiah is bringing all of these people that have never worked together in one place. So imagine people that have been in feuds for like generations are now like in the same space. Like people that worked in the temple and people that worked in the field are in the same space. People that had businesses are working with people with no businesses. People that have, uh, are very active are working with people that are very thoughtful. And, and people that are dreaming are working with planners. And everyone's coming together. And as you can imagine, this can be a chaotic scene. This could be an impossible task to deal with a city that's completely in ruins. They have no money. They have no resources. They have no desire to make a difference. But Nehemiah's inviting them into a new reality, the reality of accepting what is, but not letting it sit there too long. And so something beautiful happens. These people that have been divided for 70 plus years begin to come together and work together. Side by side, shoulder against shoulder, back on back, working together for one common goal. Putting aside their past and their present, allowing God to create something new. This collaboration that hasn't been seen for over a hundred years begin to take fruit in God's people. And I can imagine Nehemiah kind of focused on the wall, making sure it gets done. But more important than the wall getting done, he's caring about people's hearts being rebuilt. Families coming together, a community coming together, a nation coming together to allow God to work through them. What if we came together today with one purpose and one goal? Have you thought about that before? And and this is not, you know, a value that I think we don't have because I think that if we were all to, like, do a survey and we were were to say, like, ask the question, is LifePoint a loving church? Like, most of us would say, yes, LifePoint is a loving church. But why is it a loving church? What evidences do we have that it's a loving church? Like what fruit is there on a week by week basis that this is a loving church? Sometimes we have these aspirational values of things that we want to become but aren't yet. And we kind of get stuck in what is but isn't yet. I think that if we were to just think about what life point is and what life point would become, we would all get excited. Not because it's my vision or my desire, but because it's our vision, our desire. Not it's because it's a Seventh-day Adventist thing or a conference thing, but it's because it's a God thing. 
Not because we just woke up one day when wanting to make the world a better place and we just have this pride that we, can, we have that much power and ability, but it's because the Holy Spirit is nudging us in that direction because of what Jesus did and what he's doing and what he will do. What if we came together with all of our skill sets, our backgrounds, our differences, our diversity, and just allow God to work? I want you to sit there and just dream about that as we move forward with this conversation because it's what God wants to do. It's what God wants to achieve. It's about growing God's kingdom, not our kingdom. It's his plan. And that gets me excited because I don't have to carry that burden. I don't have to carry those plans. I don't have to think about where money's going to come from. I don't think about even where people are going to come from because if I'm doing what God wants me to do, he says he's going to take care of the rest. All I need to do is to be faithful. All I need to do is to follow. I don't need to ask too many questions. I just need to say, God, you want this one thing from me? I'm going to focus on this one thing. I'm going to be laying bricks? Okay, that's all I need to do. I don't need to worry about the architect. I don't need to worry about the engineer. I don't need to worry about if this looks right. <laughs> because at the end of the day, my job is to lay a brick. My, lot, my job is to make some cement. My job is to prepare the meal. My job is to share encouragement. My job is to make sure it, it, it's colorful. Whatever it is, when we are responsible to the one thing God gives us, we are part of God's plan of building his kingdom, and it's not ours, it's his, so it's definitely going to turn out well if we do it for him. You see, God's people began to come together, and Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 6 says that once they had completed the work, once that they had gone through the time of rebuilding the city, they did it in record time. It's an amazing story. And so after it, they had rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half of its height, for the people had worked with what? It's very interesting that Nehemiah ends this here, because he could have just said, okay, we reached a milestone, we finished half of the wall. People worked great. They did what I told them to do. They followed instructions. We reached half of the work. But he doesn't share that. He says we reached half of the wall height because the people worked with all of their what? Heart. He doesn't say ability. He doesn't say strength. He doesn't say wisdom. He doesn't say with all of their repertoire. He just says with all of their heart. You see, God doesn't need our money. He doesn't need our talents. He doesn't need our gifts. He doesn't need all of our experience. He just needs our hearts. So what if this was the key to be in healthier relationships today? Books are helpful. Counseling is helpful. Resources are helpful. But if my heart's not in it, you know, a job could be a very good job where I'm putting my skill set to use, I'm making my difference in the world in some shape or form, but if my heart's not in it, I could have a nice house and a nice car, I could have, you know, decent clothing, but if my heart's not in it, you see, we can fill in the blank with this phrase with any single thing in our hearts, if, in our lives, if our heart's not in it, it probably won't make a difference. So within your reality today, where's your heart? Is your heart consumed by fear and anxiety? Is it consumed by anger? Is it consumed by the lack of forgiveness and grace in your life? Are you allowing God to work in your heart and through your heart to show you your purpose and your calling? The difference was being made in the city because their hearts were in it. And so as the wall was halfway built, their problems weren't over because neighboring countries started learning that Jerusalem was building up its walls. They remembered what Jerusalem had been in the past, this nation that worshiped God and served God and God protected and God blessed. And so they started to get afraid, these neighboring countries, and they start threatening Israel that if they continue to build this wall to protect themselves, that, that it wouldn't be good for them. And so Nehemiah's people start getting a little bit scared, and he looks at them and says, don't be afraid of them. Don't worry about the people that are hating on your life, that are creating opposition, that are saying negative words. Don't worry about they, that what they say. He says, remember who your God is. 
Remember who your God is. Remember who God, where God pulled you from. Remember how God has blessed you. Remember that he's great and awesome. Remember that you can fight for your families, for your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. You can do all of these things. Why? Because God will fight for us. Sometimes we forget that God is on our side or wants to be on our side. Sometimes we forget that in the middle of our circumstances or reality, God wants to fight for us. Sometimes we forget that we have this all-powerful and knowing God that wants to change our circumstances, but we're too stuck in how we're going to fight for ourselves. We're too stuck in how we're going to defend ourselves. We're too stuck in being sometimes these these, uh, keyboard warriors on the internet to defend God and Christianity and ourselves all in one, we forget that we don't need to fight for him, but that he fights for us. You know that God is fighting for you right now? God's fighting for your relationships. I believe that God is fighting for those friendships that were broken in the last two, three years. He's fighting for those. I believe that God is fighting for every single marriage in our world. I believe that God is fighting for every single parent-child relationship on this planet. I believe that God is fighting for every person that doesn't have a plate of food to eat. I believe that God is fighting for every person that doesn't have a place to call home. I believe that God is fighting for every person that doesn't see their value in Jesus Christ. I see that God is fighting for every single person that feels marginalized or isolated in the world that we live in today. I believe that God fights for us. When we allow him to have our hearts and step in our lives, we now are dealing with the power of with. It's mostly his power and our desire for him to use his power. And all we have to do is to let him. And so you know what they did? They let God work. They let God work and fight for them. And so the result of that fighting was that God won. God defeated the enemies. He kept the enemies away. God gave them the victory over and over and over again, even though their reality was not the best. At the end of that, in Nehemiah chapter 8, this is how it all ends, where Nehemiah goes and tells the people, go and enjoy your choice food and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. God had given them the victory. God had restored the city. The city was being rebuilt. They were seeing this relationship with God being restored. And so now they get to celebrate it. And he goes on and says, do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is what? Is our strength. I'll repeat what I said before. We can't sustain sacrifice unless we celebrate who God is and what he's doing in our lives. We can't step into the spaces that God has for us unless we remember how God has helped us in the past. So in your space today, in your reality today, how has God come through for you? If you think about the story of of Mandarin Life Point, how has God come through for us in the past? How has God transformed people in the past? How has God changed the community through us in the past? What good things has God done through our community of faith in the past, in the present? Can we celebrate those things? Can we thank God for those things? Can we allow those situations to fuel us, to give us energy into the present? About five years ago, we we all heard this, this powerful story coming out of Indonesia. It was about... The month of June in 2018, where a group about 12, 13 um, uh, teenage boys stepped in with their uh, soccer uh, assistant coach. Um, They went out for a bike ride and ended up going inside of this humongous cave. After hours of being out, parents start calling the head coach, asking him what, you know, where their kids are, what's happened, if there's any way or knowledge of when their kids are going to go back home. And when the head coach realizes that he has told his assistant coach to take the kids into a cave, he rushes out to the cave only to find out that the water in that cave had risen to a degree where no one could go in. As you can imagine, this caused a whole uproar in that tiny, tiny community in in Thailand, and people started moving from all places to find a way to get those kids out. 
A couple of hours went by and, and they weren't able to get in. They had to call in the Navy SEALs from Thailand to come in and to help them out. All of a sudden, this story starts hitting the news cycles and all around the world we're hearing this story of 13 people stuck in a cave about two and a half miles in. As you can imagine, people from all places started pouring in and asking how they could help. At one point, they thought, well, if we get enough water pumps here, we can drain the water out of the cave and they can walk out. Before they knew it, they had so many water pumps, they didn't know what to do with. They were pumping out about 40,000 gallons of water per hour, and they realized after the first six to eight hours that even pumping that amount of water was doing, making no change in the situation. Journalists started pouring in for all over the world. Humanitarian efforts were being made not only through different organizations and agencies, but through different governments. At the end of the story, uh, we learned that over 100 different government agencies offered their help, support, or finances to help these kids get out of the cave. After the Navy SEALs had sent a couple of divers in trying to get these boys out, uh, one of the divers made it the furthest, but he never made it back. He ended up drowning in his effort of trying to get these boys out, and so they had to find different ways and different methods to help these boys. And soon a day, two days, three days had passed. Soon nine days had passed where these boys and the coach had been in complete darkness and without food. Many people began to give up. Many people began to reach conclusions. Many people began to say, you know, it's impossible to get these boys out. There's no way we'll be able to do it. But yet, in the midst of that desperate reality, an impossible reality, there was a majority of people that said, if we come together and work together, we'll figure out at least one way that's possible to get these boys out. And sure enough, after 12 plus days, they were finally able to get a, a tube all the way to the boys to get some, some oxygen, and eventually they were able to get the medical help, and a diver was able to get at least some, uh, a doctor close to them to be able to tend to their wounds. Imagine now 10 plus days in complete darkness and without food. So depending on where your reality is today, you either ice, you, know, you put yourself inside that cave in complete darkness without food, or you're on the outside trying to get help to those that are in need. And after so many brains and money coming together, they figured out a way. It wasn't the ideal way. It wasn't a safe way. As a matter of fact, the stories have been written about in, in documentaries made that the way of getting the boys out by sending divers and pulling them out with a diver was not even remotely the most successful option they had, but it was the only one they had. And so sure enough, divers began to go in and they started to bring the boys out one at a time. The thing that hit me the most about this story was that they did not know if the diver and the boy would make it with life all the way out of the cave. Two and a half hours in, two and a half hours out. Two and a half hours back underwater, through water, to make it all the way back to a safe spot. But when you see pictures of this story and when you see how many people came together, even if it wouldn't have been successful, we are definitely moved by the amount of people whose heart broke for these 13 boys and were willing to travel great distances and make great sacrifices so that people that were without hope could have some sort of hope that something would be possible to bring these boys out of this cave with life. And because they were willing to sacrifice, because they were willing not to give up, because they were willing to work together with people from different cultures, different organizations, different agencies, something great happened. 13 individuals were able to come out of, this, out of that cave unharmed, full of life, being able to tell that story over and over and over again. Because people were willing to step into a tough situation and work together, this story has not only made a difference in the life of 13 people, it has made a difference in our entire planet. Imagine what we could do if we were willing to come together and work for one common goal. You know, it's not that we don't have a great story to tell. As a matter of fact, we have the best story to tell. We have the story of a God that loved us so much that even when we messed up, 
He saw us down on planet Earth. He saw us deep inside of a cave that we could not get ourselves out of. And he didn't leave us alone. He didn't give up. He didn't send his best angels. He didn't send his best Navy SEALs. He sent his own son to go inside of that cave and to pull us out. One by one, over and over and over again. And the thing that hits me about Jesus' story is that he's willing to go in the cave and making it out of the cave, knowing that the only way to do that is by giving up his own life. Jesus sees you right now. He knows your reality. He knows your heart. He knows what causes fear or the lack of sleep. He knows what's caused you to spend time with your family or your friends or with other people. And he wants to come close to you today and remind you that he loves you. And that he's willing to go back into that cave of your life over and over and over again until you are reassured, until you know for sure that he loves you, that he has a plan and purpose for your life. And so the beautiful thing about Christianity is that once Jesus brings us out and saves us, he doesn't want us to hang out out here and do nothing. He doesn't want us to hang out out here and just tell our story about how good we are because he got us out. No, God wants us to go back into the cave with him to bring people out that have no hope, to bring people out that lives or hearts are broken, to bring people out that don't know where to turn to, to bring people out that have no friends or no one close to them, to bring people out who are living in isolation. So what if the church was a church that Jesus wanted for today? What if we were willing to embrace the power of with, not for ourselves, but for our entire world? Let us pray. The only Father, we know that we can't change our realities, and most of the time we can't even accept our own realities. It's a tough, it's so hard to see the things that cause us pain or anxiety or the things that have caused isolation in our hearts and our lives. And so in this moment, in this space, Father, we pray that in only the way you can, you remind us exactly who we are. That you remind us how much you paid for us. And that we're able to see the sacrifice that Jesus makes for us over and over and over again. Father, may that soften our hearts and may that lead us to be better fathers, better mothers, better children. May it help us be better workers and employees and professionals. May it help us to be better teachers and pastors and people in the community. Father, may this power of with not be good just for us. May we allow it to be good for all of us. So as the church desires to learn its reality and to move into the future, may you give us the patience and the desire to be in your presence, to have certainty that you're leading us, to have the certainty that we're not going alone, to have the certainty to know that you fight for us. Father, we want to stand up and lift our voices today knowing that we don't worship a God that's dead or a God that's just in a book, but that we worship a God that's in heaven and a God that's on earth. That we worship a God that comes close to all those that are brokenhearted and those that are alone. That you have a God that comes close to those that mess up and have failed and you're willing to pick us back up. Father, may we stand up today and worship that God and may you be real in our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.